Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In our weekend studies, we're studying together in the book of Galatians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were at the 19th and the 20th verses of chapter 4. Now, I don't want to go back too far by way of introduction. This is uh, God's Word. The author is the Holy Spirit. There's no doubt that the Holy Spirit used Paul to pen the words, but the author is the Holy Spirit. And God has given us this epistle as a great lesson on grace and law. There was a dispute in the early church, and that dispute has never changed down through the years. Uh, that it's, it's one thing to recognize the grace of God in the person and work of Christ, but you've got to do more. You've got to add to that somehow. Uh, that's, uh, that mindset, that attitude is uh, prevalent today, even today. Uh, many a minister finds it difficult to believe that, that a person can be a child of God, uh, headed for heaven and live like you live, and I live. People find it very difficult to understand the grace of God. And we have an epistle that points out that grace is grace. It's not merit. It's so difficult for human, us, this our species, Homo sapiens, to uh, abandon ourselves to the, ourselves to the grace of God. Time and time again, you can read and you can hear sermons on passages of Scripture where the truth of that passage is really gripping the heart of the one, and, and then the final close is, and, and all of this is true if, if you'll accept. And, and then we're all going to get to heaven and walk the streets of glory. You know, thank God you finally accepted. I wasn't sure you were going to do that. And what have we done? We suddenly destroyed grace. How, it is, how it's ever so gripped the minds of men that birth is based upon something you do it isn't. In our last study in this uh, fourth chapter, we find the Holy Spirit using Paul uh, in a uh, not so well condition. Uh, we saw the same thing in Corinthians. I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified that your faith might stand in the wisdom, that your faith might not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I couldn't help but think this week as I was studying uh, for this passage of Scripture how much the ravages of age may be settling in. You know, for years it's been uh, relatively easy to read the Greek. I had a decent Greek vocabulary and all of a sudden uh, I find, you know, man, I can't recall those things like I used to. and. You know, and I think, is it fair to stand up here and teach when I don't seem to, to be able uh, to recall the tools that I used to have? And I'm greatly concerned that you concentrate on the truth of these passages. And it, it, it greatly encourages me that the Holy Spirit used Paul, who was sick and disfigured. And we went through that last week. It was the Holy Spirit's concern, more than Paul's concern, that, that your faith might not stand in the wisdom of men. I think over the years how many times I've tried that. You know, I was listening to a, a sermon where the man was trying to prove the resurrection from the dead. I never tried to prove that. It, it, I, I've tried to present evidences, and I couldn't help but think, you know, as he did that, you know, wait a minute, you know, you just missed the greatest evidence of all, the greatest possible evidence that you could have that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is because God said so. And I'm alarmed that, that it took me so long to see that someone years ago tried to raise money to find Noah's Ark you know, well, why do you want to do that? Well, you know, it'd be the greatest evangelistic event in all of human history, Steve. 
You know, more people would go to heaven if we could find the ark than any other case in human history. You know, and I, and I said, well, what are you trying to prove? Well, we're trying to prove the ark existed. And I said, what are you trying to prove? We have the greatest proof in the world. It's in the book of Genesis. Now, if I did that years ago, why, why wouldn't I do that in the resurrection? The greatest proof in the world that God exists is He said so. That Christ rose from the dead. God said He did. I can't put anything next to the power and the authority of the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit says that your faith isn't to stand in the wisdom of men. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't look at facts. You shouldn't look at logic. I am, however, suggesting that, that you ought to exalt the authority and the accuracy of this book. So we begin this morning, verse 19. Hang with me through this. I'm going to have a little bit of something I'm going to throw. I hope to be able to enlighten you to a few uh, uh, not so commonly unknown facts, uh, or not, not so commonly known facts uh, about uh, this whole issue uh, of law and grace and how that it actually has direct ties to the blessed hope that we're waiting for. So, uh, beginning at verse 19, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. You know, if you were to take a casual look at that, uh, at that birthday, you know, it would look as though that they, they needed another birth of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. On the surface, looks as though that they needed another birth. That's not true. You might, you might launch into an examination of the new birth. Uh, one is born from above by the Holy Spirit. Uh, by the will of God, not by the work of Paul. Paul's being led by the Holy Spirit to say that he has a great concern for these folks, a concern that equals the pain of childbirth. But behind the verse is clearly the, 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 the inference, the, the concern, the concern of the Holy Spirit until Christ be formed in you. That's the great concern of the Holy Spirit. And it's a passive, you're, you're not getting to form it. It's a passive voice. Uh, the word is morphos here. And in the Greek, the two words that are often used, for example, I implore you not to be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed. And we look at the word uh, conformed, that's the word uh, schema, the outward appearance. Uh, morphos. Is, is transformed what you are inwardly, what you really look like, what you really are. My little children, it's, it's the only time the Holy Spirit uses this word in, in the epistles of Paul, which are the, the Holy Spirit's presentation of what we know as doctrine. The others are types, and we can use them for great lessons in the doctrine that are given to us in the epistles and and the Holy Spirit's pointing out that this Christ that be formed in you is a passive. It isn't something you do. It's something He's going to do. And He does it with great energy, great dedication, just as, as the travail of childbirth. You know, if we were to go to Romans 8, you all know Romans 8, 28. Uh, everybody, everybody knows that. You know, they, they don't even quote it anymore. If, if, you've, if you've got any trouble in your life, you know, they just say, remember Romans 8, 28. You're supposed to know what that says. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, for whom He did foreknow them, He also did predestinate, conformed to the image of His Son, So there is not some indication in this verse of human works. It isn't uh, an opportunity for the minister to suddenly stand up and say, you know, you've got to do this. 
Christ to be formed in you. You know, you come down, uh, you shake my hand, you accept Christ, and you'll be formed. It's not what the verse says. What do you think it means to have Christ formed in you? The word morphos, morphos, means that the outward appearance is what the inward likeness really is. Schema, on the other hand, is an actor. <coughs> His outward appearance isn't what, what he is. He's supposed to be portraying something else. This word says we're to be portraying Christ. What is the subject of our epistle or the, or the subject of the chapter? Well, there are those who are suggesting that believing that Jesus Christ died in your place, that's a good start, but you've got to be subject to the law. You know, if nothing else, you need to be circumcised. You need to do something. Why? So that somebody else can see that, that you really are redeemed? That's too bad. I'm persuaded those of you who are going to heaven when you get there are going to be surprised who's there. You know, for example, it'd be a it'd be horrible for lots of Christians if some leader of Hezbollah, you know, turned out to be there. I don't know if he's going to be there. I don't know if Eichmann's going to be there. I don't know if Hitler's going to be there. Ayatollah Khomeini's going to be there. If I'd have lived back in Paul's day, I'd have said Paul wasn't going to be there. Modern in Christianity insists that they have to see something, and so did the writers, and so did the people who were under examination in this epistle. Jesus Christ died in the place of those whom God foreordained, for whom He did foreordain. Them He also did predestinate determined beforehand, conformed to the image of His Son, in whom He did predestinate. Those are the ones He called. And all that He called, He made righteous. And all that He made righteous, He glorified. That's the purpose of God. I am going to suggest to you folks that in the context of this chapter, Christ being formed in you is separation from works to recognize that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is the basis of your redemption. Astounding to me how many people I've talked to who have studied the Scriptures and, and preached for years, you know, how are you redeemed? Well, by accepting Jesus Christ. Well, could I have a passage of Scripture, please? Where, look, my only source of authority is this book, not what somebody says. Where is that passage of Scripture that says, I would be redeemed if I accepted Christ? Well, it doesn't exist. How are you saved? Oh, you're saved by accepting Christ, you know, because He died. Well, where is a verse, a Scripture that says you're saved because He died for you? It's in every modern sermon, but where is it? In the book, I'm told in Romans 5 that I am saved by His life. I've never heard anybody preach that. But I don't have a verse of Scripture that says I'm saved by His death, but it's preached every, every Sunday somewhere. It's amazing how many Christians I know who want to throw me out. And all I want is the truth of the book. If I'm wrong, I want to know that I am redeemed because a price was paid. And that price was not circumcision. It was not baptism. It was not repentance. It wasn't anything that I did. That price that was paid was the blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood of Jesus Christ is a synonym for His death in my place. When we speak of the cross of Christ or the blood of Christ, we speak of the vicarious suffering and death of Jesus Christ, vicarious in my place. If He died in my place, that's it. I don't have to accept that. I don't have to believe that. I don't have to receive that. If I do, that's, it's a one, that's wonderful. And I'm delivered from all the, the tenacious tentacles of the law. But it is not necessary for my redemption. For everyone that He 
predetermined. He pre predetermined them conform to the image of His Son. Therefore, back to my verse in verse 19. There is not there the doubt of that being formed. The, the, the verse isn't saying, I travail in birth that this might happen. It will happen for all of those who belong to Him. That was the dogmatic assertion of Romans chapter 8, verse 29. We are predetermined, conformed to the image of His Son. God did that. You didn't do that. In fact, you had absolutely no part in doing that. He did it. And so the verse, 19th verse, is not suggesting that there's doubt. This may or may not happen. Dearly beloved, sanctification basically is really getting just used to the fact that you're justified, that you've been made righteous. God has set you apart for Himself and He made you righteous. And it's a lifelong process of coming to realize the truth of that. In the present context of our study, Christ being formed in you is freedom from the law. He isn't writing to those who recognize that they're free from the the tentacles of the law, that they stand righteous because of what Christ did. Those are not the ones He's talking about. He's talking about those who become involved in the fact that what Christ did is only part of the process and you are the one that has to do something to finish it. And that is not true. I will. I desire. I will to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. Well, let's look at those words for just a moment. It's my desire to be present with you and change my voice. Now, there's several possibilities on that, and, and those possibilities are open to you. And what I say is in no way the final authority. I'm not the source of truth. This book is the source of truth. What he might be saying is, I wish I were there. I could speak more strongly or more sternly. He might be saying, I wish I were there, I'd be more kind. Or I wish I were there so I could really lovingly engage you in a conversation so that we might discuss this. The changing His voice. Either, either He wants to be more stern, less stern, more exchange of communication, or I wish I were there so that I could see Christ being formed in you and I wouldn't have to talk like this. I can now spend my time on the grandeurs of Christ. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your affection on things above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. I just wish I were there so that we could get involved in a conversation that is separate from the law and, the, and, and where we focused on Christ Himself. Not self. Astounding how many sermons I hear on what I ought to be doing and not one word about what Christ did. This book is not a rule book for my life. It's not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. It is primarily the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. This book is not a rule book for my life. This book is not a marriage manual. If you want to build a big following, you want to make it carnal, you know... Uh, you know, just preach law. But if, but if you make it spiritual, it won't be a big following. I can promise you that. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book doesn't tell you how to manage your money. It doesn't tell you how to live with your wife. It tells you who Christ is and what He did. This book is God's revelation of Himself to us. You know, there's hardly a minister I've talked to. You know, when I say, you know, could you put in one sentence what you think the Bible is? They almost always come back, well, it's a revelation of the person and the work of Christ. Is that what you preach? Well, no, I think my job is to preach Christian responsibility. I think my job, if you want to call it a job, I, I don't, it, it is to declare what this book says, and it's the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And when Christ is formed in you, you're dead to the law. The law has no hold on you. 
I wish I were there so that we could talk about the grandeurs of Christ, for I'm perplexed about you. My Bible says I stand in doubt of you. I don't think that's a fair translation. I think the word is, is, per, the word is perplexed. I'm disturbed about this. How many Christians, let me ask you, how many Christians are disturbed and perplexed like this? I think people leave this channel because I talk about the truth of this book, the person and the work of Christ. But Pastor Steve, don't you know anybody that would ride ATVs on a Sunday afternoon is going to hell? And I and I and I, I say to them, you know, how about their wives and kids? They're riding a. Are they going to hell too? Well, I'm not sure about them, but but every person that plays on Sunday is going to hell. He had them all in hell. How about somebody that gossips? Well, I'm not real sure whether they're going to hell or not. Wow, okay, so it's a lot worse to ride an ATV on Sunday afternoon than gossip. He wasn't even sure about murder. You know, David committed murder, but since he repented, he's going to heaven. But an ATV guy, no chance. You know, and you laugh, but he, he was dead serious. To be free from the grasp of the law is unbelievable. Are we disturbed about it? Law, teaching law, preaching that says that we're under law as a rule of life. Are we disturbed by that? Are we perplexed when we hear others talk like that? Are we disturbed that somebody thinks that you can't go to heaven if you ride a horse on Sunday? Are we, are we disturbed that somebody thinks that you can't go to heaven if you're a woman and you wear britches? What have we done, folks, with this revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ? The only thing we can see is the outward appearance. So Christ being formed in you, I believe, in this present context is the realization that we're free from the law and people don't like that. They don't like that. I was raised in a church where those who were really on fire for Christ, they'd come Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night prayer meeting. Those who were mediocre Christians, they'd come Sunday morning and Sunday evening, and then those who might be going to hell, they only came on Sunday morning. And that was almost Scripture. What, what were we doing? We're looking at what people are doing and we're confusing it with grace. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. It's a present tense in the Greek. Tell me, those of you who are having this desire to be under the law, do you listen to the law? Or listen to the law. Now, some years ago, an individual in the church who I, I counted as a real friend was just furious with me because I suggested that the law was carnal. Folks, what law can you think of that applies to your spirit? All of the laws of the Old Testament, you did with what? The flesh. You couldn't keep those with the spirit. The justified man lives by the faithfulness of God. By His faithfulness, we're told. But keeping the law, that's something that the human flesh had to do. It wasn't your soul, your spirit, that brought the lamb to be sacrificed. Any regulation that you want to put on me as a Christian can only be put on my old man. So don't you hear the law. These are all the things that are going to be placed on the old man, not the new man. Let's talk about the law. It has been written, perfect tense, passive voice. God does that all the time with these words. It's been written in past time and it stands written today. It is truth that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Now you know 
that there couldn't be anybody in the audience in Galatia who didn't know that. That Abraham had two sons. You all know the account. God came, came to Abraham, said, you're going to have a kid. Uh, Abraham's name, Abram, means father, a father of many. Did he have any? I, I don't even know how to illustrate that. You know, if you had a name uh, and you weighed uh, 600 pounds and your name meant light, people would laugh at you. Can you imagine walking into Abraham? What's your name? Uh, Ab Abram. Oh, father of many. How many kids you got? Uh, none. And now he's 80. And God says, you're going to have a son, finally. And I'm going to change your name to Abraham. Put the rough breathing on it there. Abraham means father of a multitude. He still doesn't have any. He talks to Sarah about this. God's changed my name to father of a multitude. you got to be kidding. We don't have any kids. And we're running out of time here, Abraham. I mean, we got to do something about this. Listen to me. we got to do something about this. And you remember he gave her Hagar and he had a child. His name was Ishmael. And then God came and said, well, that's not the kid. And Abraham said, oh, I wish it were. This is my son. And God said, no, no, your wife Sarah is going to have a child. And Sarah laughed in her tent because she knew that she couldn't have a child. And 14 years go by, still no kid. All we got is Ishmael. And when Abraham's 100 and, and sterile and Sarah's too old to have a kid, they have a kid that's miraculous. Why did God do that? Folks, why did God do this? To show you and I that we are not under law, but grace. That we can't add anything to what Christ did to be redeemed. Redeemed totally separate from anything that we did. What did Isaac do to receive the blessing? Nothing. No, God allowed this so that you and I could see that we are children of promise. It couldn't be Abraham's sex drive and it couldn't be Sarah's body. It had to be a miraculous birth. And the reason God did that, and if you were to go to heaven and dig up Abraham and say, you know, wasn't that awful? Oh God, wasn't that awful? What kind of a God is it that would make you suffer for a hundred years before you had that child of promise? And the only reason He did that is so He could teach you and I a lesson. I am persuaded Abraham would say, was it a hundred years? I don't remember that. God can do as He pleases with His own people. Think of the wonder of the lesson. Abraham had two sons, one by a slave girl, one by a free. The one who was born of the slave girl was born after the flesh. Sarah and Abraham and Hagar got together. That, that must have been a wrenching moment for Sarah. I mean, you know, most women don't want to put some other woman in bed with her husband. I don't know how much of Sarah's motive was to make sure God didn't lie or how much of it was to make Abraham happy in having a child and how much of it was her thought that, well, I'll have a child by a surrogate and it'll be my child and I'll raise that child. But whatever her motive was, it was after the flesh and it was contrary to the promise of God. What it says was, or what it did say, listen, please, I beg you to listen. What it said was that what God has promised, he, he can do it as long as we give Him some help. Okay? Jesus Christ died in your place. And you're redeemed. And that's true. As long as you can, as long as you can give Him some help, as long as you accept, receive, repent, be baptized, attend church, go to prayer meeting, mow the grass, I don't know, of wipe runny little noses in the nursery. I don't know. None of, none of that, folks, is true. This was engineered by the flesh. The one was after the flesh, but he, Isaac, of the free woman, was by promise. By promise. 
Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are all the children of promise. You are a child of promise. Not because you accepted, believed, received, or anything else, but because God promised you to Christ. He foreordained you. He predetermined you. He, he to be conformed to the image of His Son, free from the law, and He called you and He made you righteous. But as then, he which was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. And the predominant persecution, folks, in the modern Christian church today is based on law, legalism, humanism. We stand redeemed because of what Christ did and nothing else. Nothing of what we did. We are children of promise. However, nevertheless, he that was born after the flesh persecutes him that is born after the Spirit. This is as true today as it was in Isaac's day and in the days in which the Holy Spirit had Paul write this. We are new creations in Christ Jesus, and that is true because of what Christ did, not because of anything that we did. And we can rejoice in that. Now I'm going to throw a chart up here for you to look at. I hope you will take a screenshot, save it, take time to look at it. This is where it becomes most interesting to me. Sarah. God can do it, but we got to help Him. Now I entered the slave woman Hagar and a son born out of the flesh. Sarah's reasons for giving Hagar to Abraham, whatever they were, they were of the flesh. We are children of promise. Isaac, not Ishmael. Ishmael, that's Ishmaelites. The Saudis are all Arabs, all Arabs. Saudi Arabia. Little, uh, well, I hope you find this interesting as I do. That's the Ishmaelite people in Psalm 83. Like most Arabs throughout the Middle East and Africa, the Saudis claim to be the true chosen people as descendants of Ishmael. It was Saudi Arabia who voted no to the 1947 UN resolution to create a Jewish state and supported the Arab invasions of 1948, 1967, and 1973 with troops as well as finances. They do not have... Fond feelings for Israel. Some Arabs even, in fact, inside of Israel look for its destruction as a, as a Jewish state and even have representation in the Knesset, the parliament. Israel should... Let me quote you. Let me, let me quote. Dude, uh, this, is, this is Ahmed Tibi. Israel should be defined as a state of its own nationalities. There are two nationalities in Israel. One is the Jewish majority. One is the Arab-Palestinian minority, said the deputy speaker of the Knesset in January of 2014. Saying that Israel is the Jewish state is neglecting our existence, our very existence, and our narrative, and I will not accept that, he said. Galatians, law versus grace. It's the whole context of what we've been studying. Ishmael versus Isaac, the child of promise. Not human works, not Islam. Mankind's bent toward adding something to what Christ did and Islam are intimately related. Islam is Christianity's counterfeit. Law is grace's counterfeit. Man is God's counterfeit. Flesh is the Spirit's counterfeit. Self is Christ's counterfeit. Arabia is Israel's counterfeit. Satan is God's counterfeit. Works is Christianity's counterfeit. 
When like Sarah, you believe God needs your help. It's not Christ that's formed in you. It's sin, self, law, the flesh. It's all fleshly. It's not spiritual. Adding something to the finished work of Christ has direct ties to the Arab-Israeli conflict in the last day's prophecy. You want to live your life as a Christian where that your very existence, your very life, your walk, your relationship with the Lord reflects something other than, than what was came to you by promise? That it came through works? That, that it has direct ties, connections to Ishmael. The Arab-Israeli conflict that we're seeing take place around us today. That we have my whole lifetime. In fact, I mean, I was born in well, I was born in '56, so I came in after you know, 1948, after the picture. I've never been at peace. Just as there will never be a peace until Christ returns, there will never be the peace and the joy in your heart that God desires for you to have until you realize that your salvation, that your eternal life, and your salvation. Is all purely by grace. That includes your new birth. You had nothing to do with it. The baby, okay, doesn't say push. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful again for your word and would would ask that you'd take that which has been poorly spoken, filter out that the error but seal to our hearts the grand truth that we're yours and that you have promised us to Christ and we are yours. May that truth grip our hearts and we go our way rejoicing in the liberty that we have in Christ Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. I love you all. I truly do. Pray for us. We pray for you constantly. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.